The Land of the Dragon. Qianlong ruled China for sixty years. All this time, strong Western countries were grabbing more and more land for themselves. Spain ruled over much of South America and some of North America too. France owned land in North America. England had colonies in North America, and now it was spreading into India as well. Meanwhile, China was doing plenty of grabbing of its own. The center of the Chinese Empire lay around the Yellow and the Yangtze rivers, where the ancient Chinese civilization had first grown. This China of the Eighteen Provinces was home to millions of Han Chinese and Manchu people, but this center was only part of China. Imagine that you're standing on the roof of the Forbidden Palace, looking out over the endless roofs of Beijing. You hear a swish behind you. You turn and see that an imperial dragon has landed behind you. This imperial dragon, the symbol of the emperor's power, has five toes on each foot. His body is long and snake-like. His tail is the tail of a fish. He dips his head, crowned with the sharp antlers of a deer. His eyes glow red. You climb aboard the scaly body. He bends his snaky neck around to see whether you're comfortable, and sees that you're too small to straddle him comfortably. So, obligingly, he shrinks a little. Imperial dragons can change size whenever they like. They can also turn themselves into water spouts and whirl across the sea. You hope this dragon won't turn himself to water while you're aboard. The dragon flaps its wings and rises. You're sailing over those endless rooftops toward the north, with a rising sun behind you. The red light falls first on the walls of Beijing, and then on hills and mountains carpeted with rough, scrubby trees and long, wiry grass. Ridges and peaks pass beneath you. You're flying over the uplands of China, where peasants farm rice on the warm southern sides of the mountains and wheat. In the drier north, but then the hills and fields drop away into a flat brown plain. The dragon swoops down. You see sand beneath you, yellow and white, shifting in the howling winds. A sand rat scuttles away into its hole. A vulture, hunched on a single low tree, flaps resentfully away as the dragon approaches. You're flying over the Gobi Desert, a huge, dry plain, and the edge of Mongolia, homeland of the descendants of Genghis Khan and his Mongol horde. Beneath you, a group of nomads comes out of their felt yurts and looks up, mouths open with amazement. They recognize the dragon because now Mongolia belongs to China. Chenlong's grandfather, Kanshi, invaded Mongolia. And forced its government to pay allegiance to him. Now Mongolia sends tribute every year to the Chinese emperor. The dragon flies further north, leaving the desert behind. Ahead of you lies Mongolia's capital city, Ulan Bator. The dragon banks along its walls and turns southwest. As you leave Ulan Bator behind, you peer down at its streets. Chinese soldiers patrol the alleys, watching for any sign of rebellion. Now you soar further south, toward the lands where the Turkish tribes fought to spread the Turkish Empire. But the glory days of the Ottoman Turks are gone. China now rules over part of this Turkish land. It is called Chinese Turkestan. Below you, the dome of a mosque glitters white in the sun. These Turks are still Muslim, but they pay allegiance to the Buddhist Emperor of China. In the forests beyond the mosque, you see a white puff of dust. The dragon swoops down again, so that you can see the war band of Chinese soldiers headed deep into Turkestan. The Turks are restless. Chenlun fights continually to keep them under his control. You've traveled halfway along China's borders. Now the sun stands overhead, and the dragon is beginning to turn back toward the east. Below you lies the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. 
it casts its shadow over the land to its north. This ancient country, Tibet, is a mysterious and a little-known place. Old people whisper of a hidden kingdom in its snowy mountains called Shangri-La. Those who live in Shangri-La are never hungry. No one grows old in Shangri-La, and no one dies. The Tibetans are a peaceful people, governed not by a king, but by a Buddhist monk called the Dalai Lama, who rules alongside a Mongol prince. China hasn't completely conquered this southern land, but the emperor is scheming to add it to his collection of countries. Just a few years ago, the Mongol prince who was supposed to help the Dalai Lama rule fought with other Mongols who wanted to control Tibet. The emperor sent Chinese soldiers into Tibet to protect the Dalai Lama. Those Chinese soldiers are still in Tibet, even though the revolt is over. Their leaders, two Chinese officials called high commissioners, are helping the Dalai Lama rule. Slowly, the high commissioners are gaining more and more power. You leave Tibet behind and fly further to the east and the south. Here, a huge piece of land juts down from the Chinese mainland into the ocean. You are so high that you can see the water on both sides. The Bay of Bengal on the western side of this land and the South China Sea on the east. The land below you sparkles silver and red. The dragon swoops down once more so that you can see the country of Burma on the Bay of Bengal's edge. Rivers wind between mountain peaks, slowly widening out into flat, glittering floodplains where men and women stoop over the rice fields. The sun, now beginning to sink behind you in the west, shines brightly on houses made of red-glazed brick and of timber with bright tin roofs. In the streets of the villages, men in blue robes and women with gold and jade in their hair walk toward the Buddhist temple. But you see Chinese soldiers marching toward the north of Burma, ready to fight. The emperor is worried about Burma. It's growing a little too powerful. In the next three years, those soldiers will invade Burma four times. They'll never own the country but the people of the north will be forced to pay tribute. You fly straight across toward the South China Sea and a long, thin country that lies along its edge, the country of Vietnam. Chinese soldiers trudge north through wet rice fields, headed home. For years, China has been trying to take over Vietnam. For the moment, the invasion has failed. The royal family of Vietnam has driven the Chinese invaders out once more. The imperial dragon snorts in frustration. He veers suddenly out over the water, almost dumping you into the surf below. You cling to his neck, hoping that he won't dissolve into a water spout. But he's just headed out toward an island that lies off China's coast, the island of Taiwan. Here, the Chinese effort to conquer its neighbor has succeeded. Taiwan has become part of China's southern province, Fujian. You see boats sailing from the mainland toward the Chinese coast. Chinese settlers are streaming into Taiwan. The island's population has swelled by half a million people. The dragon expands a little with pride. He veers inland to show you one more successful Chinese conquest, the country of Korea, now paying tribute to the emperor. When the dragon sets you gently down back on the rooftop of the Forbidden Palace, you have traveled around the edges of the largest empire in the world. At this time, perhaps 900 million people live in the world. Over 300 million of those people belong to the Chinese Empire. France and Spain and England are powerful countries. But one-third of all the people in the entire world live under the flag of the imperial Chinese dragons.